everybody. My name is Bridget Cabrera, she, her, hers, and I'm the Executive Director of Methodist Federation for Social Action. We're really excited to be co-hosting this series of webinars with our coalition partner, United Methodist for Kairos Response. I will drop some more information about MFSA in the chat so you can learn more about us and get a bit more familiar with us. Just a few instructions about our time today. We are recording this call and that will, recording will be shared by both UMKR and MFSA in the following days. Um, you will be emailed that information. You'll also be added to our um, email communications. So um, you'll be able to continue to stay in touch with both of our organizations. If you have questions that come up during our time together, please type them in the chat box. There will be a time for questions, but you don't have to wait until that time. You can type your questions in the chat box as they come to you. And we ask for the rest of our time during our webinar that we keep that chat box clear only for questions for our speakers. And if you want to talk individually to each other, um, please uh, do that individually and privately. You can change who sees your message by clicking on to uh, right above where you would type in your message. Uh, there's a clicking on to um, and changing it from everyone to the person you want to direct um, that message to. We're also offering closed captioning for this webinar. Um, if you would like to use that, click closed caption option and click show subtitles to view. We're uh, doing our best to take down um, as much as we can with the closed captioning and apologize in advance for any um, misspellings or errors. Um, and now I'll uh, turn this over uh, to our moderator. Good morning, everybody around the world. This is Jim Nibelink uh, coming to you from Colorado today, but I'm a member of the United Methodist Church in Tucson, Arizona and uh, on the steering committee of UMKR. That's United Methodist for Kairos Response. We were founded about 10 years ago to respond to the urgent call from Christians in Palestine to end the Israeli occupation and achieve a just peace in the Holy Land. UMKR works through nonviolent means and in partnership with Palestinian Christians to achieve our shared goals of freedom, justice, and equality for all Palestinians and all Israelis. Couple of other notes, uh, our webinar series typically takes place on the second Wednesday of each month uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern, in this next case, October Eastern Daylight Time still. And uh, we'll be celebrating our 10th anniversary as an organization and hope to come up with a special program for everyone that uh, may wish to tune into that as we celebrate together. We uh, encourage the questions, there'll be uh, plenty of time after our two presenters are completed. We do have uh, normally a time limit of about one hour, but today given the fact that about 400 people are registered and we have uh, obviously a hot topic to discuss, we will probably run over. I'll mention it one hour when we get there and we certainly understand for those who have committed just one hour to us that you may wish to sign off at that time. But we will continue depending on the number of questions that are left for another 10 or 15 minutes past that. And we thank you for your indulgence. We are pleased and honored uh, to have two wonderful presenters with us today between MFSA and UMKR. Uh, we're excited to be able to present this webinar and the expertise of these two panelists. Bishop Hope Ward was elected a Bishop of the United Methodist Church in 2004. Her first assignment was to the Mississippi Conference. After serving eight years there, she was assigned to the North Carolina Conference, where she is currently serving. Her pastoral experience includes local church pastor, conference director of Connectional Ministries, and district superintendent. Bishop Ward has served as president of the General Board of Global Ministries, which is our primary agency in support of missions around the world. She is currently on our General Board of Church and Society, which is responsible for United Methodist Ministries of Social Justice throughout the world. Her interest in human rights for the people of Palestine and Israel is reflected in her being named as the first chair 
of the Israel-Palestine Task Force created by General Conference 2016. We welcome Bishop Ward. Dr. Mark Braverman is a Jewish American whose family has deep roots in the Holy Land. He is executive director of Kairos USA, an ecumenical organization founded in response to the call from Palestinian Christians for international support for the people of Palestine and Israel. Dr. Braverman is a noted writer and speaker who focuses on religious beliefs and theology with an emphasis on the function of interfaith relations in the search for a just peace between Israel and Palestine. Mark's ecumenical involvement includes serving on the steering committee of the World Council of Churches Palestine-Israel Ecumenical Forum and as an advisor to leaders of many, many U.S. denominations on the issue of Israel and Palestine. And we welcome Mark. And Mark, why don't you please get us started? Need to unmute. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow I got muted. Okay. Um, you know, I'm really pleased to see uh, to to be here at the invitation of UMKR and um, uh, and MFSA. Uh, really, I, I, in some ways, along with the Presbyterians, I, I really started with you folks, uh, and I want to uh, start with a story. It's my I call it my favorite Methodist story, and uh, it's perfect for our um, for our topic. In 2008, um, the Methodist General Conference was held in Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, I was just really sort of getting started. I come back in 2006 from um, my first real trip to Palestine, and I was kind of on fire about all of this, and I was kind of learning the ropes. And I got a call from, um, from UMKR and also from MFSA. They needed a Jewish speaker or a Jewish person to be at the pre-conference hearing um, where uh, delegates to the general conference um, gather to hear about the issues that are going to be coming up. And um, there was a, the way it works is that, that there, are, there are panels <clears throat> on some of the issues and then people are recognized from the floor and it's kind of pre-wired that you're going to be recognized if you've if it's been set up beforehand and one of the issues was divestment i think from caterpillar which um this is back in 2008. so uh i said sure um and the, the day came and there was a heated debate uh, on the panel for and against divesting from caterpillar and um I was recognized and I had 90 seconds, I believe. So I got up and I made a, a, a very impassioned speech about how um, uh, I know you're, you're gonna to be told that it is anti-Israel and anti-Semitic and unfriendly to the Jews to support this. But I have to tell you that if you really wanna love the Jewish people, you should do this for us because we're in big trouble and there needs to be an effective way to, um, to stop Israel's actions. Um, and when I said that thing about if you really want to love the Jewish people, and I'm telling you as a Jew, please do this, please vote for this thing, jaws dropped and then there was applause. So I thought, oh, well, this is a piece of cake. You know, this is going to work really well. Uh, after I was called, um, a, a rabbi from the um, Simon Wiesenthal Center stood up and he was the other Jewish voice that they had programmed and I knew that was coming. He did not use his 90 seconds. I didn't clock it, but he couldn't have stood up for more than 15 or 20 seconds. So tall man, very soft-spoken, had a yarmulke on. I, I knew who the guy was. And he said this. He said, I know you're being told that this resolution is not anti-Semitic, but I gotta tell you, it feels that way to us. And he sat down and that was it. So all he had to do was to lift his little finger and play that card and it was over. And as you know, I mean, you guys have been on a long journey. The thing didn't pass. So um, that was really, among other things, my first sort of introduction and education to this whole, to this whole issue. And what I found was that as a Jew coming back from Palestine on fire to tell my story to my community, which did not want to listen to me, my Jewish community, 
that the churches that I started to speak to flung open their doors to hear this message. At the same time, I also heard from many people, especially clergy, you know what, we can't do this. We have to put this off the table. We, I feel responsible for Jewish suffering and for Jewish slaughter, and that trumps the, um, the issue of human rights in Palestine. And that really, this is the bottom line. This is what we're facing. You all know this. So I want to start off by talking about, if you really want to understand this issue of, of, of anti-Semitism, uh, you really need to understand it from the inside of the Jewish experience. So let me just say a couple of quick things about that. The first word you need to remember is that what you are confronting is fear. The people, the Jewish citizens of Israel, and to some extent, it generalizes to Jews the world over, lives in the existential reality that we have been, it's in our DNA, and it's, we've been taught it from childhood, that the world hates us, that the next Holocaust is around the corner, and that the only defense against that is to have this safe place, this fortress. The early Zionism was supposed to be a, for a Jewish cultural center for self-determination. It was very much in the zeitgeist of the late 19th century. Everybody was having their own nation to protect themselves. That's totally anachronistic now. But somehow, for Jews to do that has survived. And we feel this in our bones. The idea of challenging Israel um, is scary. Um, and the Arabs, as I was taught to call them growing up, were the latest iteration uh, going all the way back to Pharaoh and all, through the pogroms and through Hitler um, uh, of, of this enemy that seeks to destroy us, as our literature says. And now we have Iran, um, which I think Bibi Netanyahu wakes up every morning and thanks God for Iran. It's, it's you know, after, after Hamas, this is a gift to, to Israel and, and it's, it's um, its diplomatic and political agenda. Um, the other thing I want to say is that Jews as a collective suffer from unresolved collective community post-traumatic stress disorder. It's unresolved. Um, and that's why we have built ourselves a fortress to protect ourselves because what happens with trauma is you lose the ability to trust. It's our own tragedy that we have not resolved this. That's why we have this catastrophe of political Zionism. I think it's an understandable but forgivable catastrophic mistake. We have to figure out how to dig ourselves out of this hole. But what I want to say to you is that that's our problem, not yours. And I'll say more about that. So the second thing I want to talk about um, is why is this an important issue for the church? There are so many other causes to take up, especially these days. We can talk about intersectionality, we can talk about all the struggles being one, and I believe that very, very strongly, but at the same time, one of the challenges that, that, that we face um, is, um, you know, and, and really one of the objections to BDS, et cetera, and I'll talk more about BDS, is that it's singling out Israel. So why uh, is this special? Well, it is special, it certainly is special for Christians and for the church because uh, today, um, as far as I know, I stand to be corrected, the only um, major human rights issue in the world today that is being actively defended by uh, churches and justified by the Bible and by uh, Christian theology is uh, Israel's crimes against the Palestinians. So you bet that the church has a specific uh, job to do here. It's not the first time. I mean, if you take a look at, I mean, the, the, the church and Christianity and Christian theology has been involved in um, colonialism from the age of discovery, um, you know, five, six hundred, for five or six hundred years. That's still very much alive in neocolonialism today. Uh, we have the, the case of chattel slavery in the United States where, you know, slaves, the, the, the master had a whip in one hand and the Bible in the other, saying, obey your masters, you know, quoting from, from, from Paul. Um, and of course, there's apartheid South Africa, 
where the Afrikaners absolutely had a civil religion and, and we talked about themselves as the chosen people and used the Bible to say, we have to take this land, God wants us to do this. So uh, it's an old story and it, unfortunately it's very, very much alive in the case of Palestine today. So it has to be taken on. Um, and we have this very specific piece of theology called Christian Zionism. Um, it's important to remember, and this is the last point I want to make about this, is that, that it comes in several forms. You have the classic kind of fundamentalist Christian Zionism, um, which, which takes the Bible literally, and the short story of that is um, God really wants the Jews to have Israel. Uh, when the last non-Jew is kicked out of Jerusalem, Jesus is coming back the next day. And um, that's a powerful force. Um, certainly see this um, more than ever. Um, it is absolutely non-biblical. It is a heresy, capital H. It uh, turns its back on everything that the Gospels and Jesus uh, represented in saying this temple is gone and Pentecost sending people out leaving Jerusalem, passing through Judea and Samaria, those are the words that are used, speaking all the languages of the world, the message cannot be more clear. Tribalism is over. One chosen people, one family, okay. If you want to talk about the covenant, that's fine. It's done its job. Now we move on, and this is for everyone. So to backtrack and say, well, actually, maybe not so much, um, we have to uh, honor the original covenant, and uh, we slide right back into Israel and, and, and this justifies Zionism, absolutely non-biblical. More powerful and more dangerous and also more workable, hiding in plain sight in mainline Christianity. And that's what we really need to talk about. You know, don't bother talking to the Kufi people. You know, they're not gonna listen to you. But um, evangelicals, uh, broad middle of evangelicals, as well as the uh, mainline denominations, um, are very open to um, questioning and listening and talking about their theology. And it, the Christian Zionism is very strong. A lot of it is the guilt that ha uh, and the feeling of responsibility for Jewish suffering. Some of it is also um, some understandings of the Bible. Uh, no, it does. It does say in Genesis, um, you get the land. So there's, again, there's this question of, well, as Christians, um, how do we understand the promises in the Old Testament? How do we understand God's relationship to the Jewish people? And these are issues that have to be taken up very, very clearly. There are good answers to that question. But I think the bottom line, what it really, really comes down to is, can you be unapologetically Christian and say, yes, that's all in the Old Testament. And in fact, it was superseded. Do you hear me? I used that word. It was superseded. It was replaced by a new covenant, something new. And it was Jesus who was a radical, grassroots organizing, reforming Jew saying, we have to move on from that. Because look at what has happened. Look at the temple. Look at the priests and the Pharisees. Look at how we've gotten into bed with the Roman Empire. Okay, that's not Torah. So God promised us and chose us, yes. And now it's time for us to say it's for everybody. Now, what's happened is that post-World War II and post-Holocaust, Christians in their zeal to... Um, Encourage Christianity of its anti-Judaism, replacement theology and supersessionism became the great evil. But you've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, it was a great evil. Yes, replacement theology is non-biblical. You know, it came along with Augustine. Not a good thing. But now it's time to say, let's embrace this original Jewish reformist movement that became the Christian church, the Church of Jesus Christ, which says, that's past. And that makes Zionism a heresy. That makes Zionism a racism. You have to be able to say that. 
you will be called the worst name you can be called, which is anti-Semitic, and I can't tell you what to do about that, especially to your to clergy. It's a, it's a big cross to pick up, but I, I would want you to pick it up. Um, the relationships that you have built with Jewish friends, colleagues, family members, or institutional personal levels are precious. We have generations of work that have gone into that. This issue of Palestine and Israel threatens to blow that up, and I'm afraid I can't give you many comforting words about that. That's why it's a cross to pick up. Um, all right, what else do I want to cover here? Um, what to do. Let's just end up by speaking briefly about BDS. Um, BDS is a, it's a beautiful thing in many ways. First of all, it's, it's a beautiful thing. The other thing that's beautiful about it is that it's working. Israel has, now it's going on 10 years now, has identified BDS as an existential and security threat to the state of Israel. And when I first heard that, and this was back in 2010, I said, yes, it's working. And it continues to work. Um, so it's a gift to the movement. And, you know, we are now fighting um, Zionism on a battleground of our choosing. And this is a gift from the Palestinians in establishing the BDS movement. Uh, there's so many arguments in its favor. It's nonviolent. It's time tested. It worked with South Africa um, with respect to our own experience here in the United States. When people talk about, well, I can't boycott Israel, I say, well, you're not boycotting the Jews, you're boycotting Israel, which is a sovereign state. And there are Jews within Israel that are asking you to do that. Not many, but their voice, they're courageous and their voices are loud. But what word in Montgomery bus boycott do you not understand? We believe in this and it works. The Germans and many Europeans uh, Dutch, Germans, um, get people who have an even bigger burden of guilt about the Jews, and especially Germans, where they think about the early boycott uh, of the of Jews of the Third Reich, have very, very powerful associations so that it's not easy for them to get over that, but they need to understand that this is totally, totally different than the anti-Semitism um, of, of the past. Um, Here's another thing I want to say about anti-Semitism and about this issue of how do we as um, Americans, um, and I would say also pointedly as those of us who are white Americans, um, understand this. Anti-Semitism is an evil. It exists. I don't have to be lectured as a Jew about how anti-Semitism is real. And like any racism, it's, it's, it's an evil. But in this context, I'm gonna make a bold statement here and I'll be happy to discuss this and I'm gonna end soon so we have plenty of time for discussion after, um, after, after Bishop Ford, who I'm really pleased to be with today. She's my new friend, it's wonderful. Um, in this context, fighting against anti-Semitism deep down means fighting in favor of whiteness. I'll say that again. Fighting anti-Semitism is fighting in defense of whiteness. All that that means, white supremacy, uh, anti-feminism, racism of uh, all kinds, um, isolationism, xenophobia. Whiteness, which began back in the colonial uh, era. Uh, it's Eurocentric white patriarchalism. Um, standing up for Palestine, like standing up for, you know, like liberation theology back in Latin America in the last century, um, or Black Lives Matter today, um, is um, defending a movement that is a threat to the dominant order of white supremacy. So again, over here, we've got to put anti-Semitism per se, which is bad and evil and has to be fought. Over here, we have a sovereign state, which is now a rogue state 
It's a criminal state. It's a racist state operating just like apartheid South Africa um, based on a, a racist white supremacist ideology. And if you're a black or brown Jew in Israel, they can tell you about that as well. And the two have to be kept separate. And so the anti-Semitism charge in this context is a defense against the threat that our movement presents um, to, uh, to, to that white dominant, to the white, do that white dominant culture. Um, and I would, I would just leave you with that. Um, the best defense when you're accused of anti-Semitism, or even if it's in the air, is to say, look, um, I uh, agree with you about anti-Semitism, okay? But for you to say to me that taking on the Palestinian cause is anti-Semitic or even feels like anti-Semitism means that you are conflating the state of Israel with the Jewish people and Zionism with Judaism. They are not the same. Before 1948, the year of my birth, and the establishment of the State of Israel, most of organized Judaism, the major denominations, the advocacy groups, the Anti-Defamation League, which in those days were the good guys. My father was a member. Um, Hat will tell you that, um, that this was, um, uh, that anti-Semitism was, was a bad thing. Um, you have to remember that those, in those days, most of organized Judaism was anti-Zionist. We don't agree with the whole idea of a Jewish state and ethnic nationalism being confused with Judaism. Once 1948 happened, embers of the oven still smoldering, there was a train and you had to be on it. And that has what has dominated um, the discourse. Uh, that is no longer true. In my view, we've passed from the post-Holocaust era to the, for all of us now, but especially for Jews, to the post-Nakba era. Our story as Jews now is no longer what was done to us, but we, what we are now doing um, to another people. So um, those issues really need to be very, very clearly defined and um, we have to be able to distinguish the state of Israel from the Jewish people and Judaism from Zionism. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mark. That's uh, certainly a, a comprehensive overview and, and provocative uh, of some questions already. We'd like now to turn to uh, Bishop Hope for uh, her perspective on uh, this question of anti-Semitism and the state of Israel. Bishop? Thank you, and such an honor to be <clears throat> on this webinar with, with Mark, uh, who is to me a teacher uh, and a new, a new friend. I, um, I think it's important that we focus on the topic as a question, the power of the question. Jesus asked 307 questions. He was asked 103 questions. He answered three. <laughs> In other words, he asked 100 questions for every answer that he gave. <clears throat> and the power of the question, is it, is it anti-Semitic to criticize the state of Israel, uh, is a power that we can use as we teach, as we share, as we work. The question uh, hanging in the air around and above our people can help us open our minds and hearts to new ways of thinking, uh, to new ideas, and to new learnings. Also, I want to focus on that word criticize, because criticize immediately takes a connotation of negative criticism. But to criticize is to evaluate, to analyze, to judge, and criticism uh, is also a gift. It's a gift that we give to one another. As people sharing humanity, and for us, the gift of faith in different ways, in different places, in different contexts, 
we, we are able uh, to help one another live into the very best of our traditions, to draw deeply from the roots of our heritage, and to help one another self-correct in ways that are good and faithful and true. Let me give you an example. I'm a United Methodist, and some years ago <clears throat> in Mississippi, working with the Episcopal Church, our Episcopalian friends worked with us to convene a celebration of our shared heritage. I was surprised to learn that the feast day of John and Charles Wesley had as an appointed text the Isaiah text, I give you as light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And when I saw that, I thought, that's what these folks think of our ministry. This is what our Episcopal friends think United Methodists are. This is what our Episcopal evaluation of our ministry is. It was such a gift and it was self-correcting for me and expanded my own sense of who I have been called to be in the family of faith of which I'm a part. We know in the Christian lectionary movement are moving through the book of Exodus in our Old Testament and the Psalms appointed sing of the deliverance of God's people. The appointed Psalm for Sunday is Psalm 114. When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of strained language, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel God's dominion. The sea looked and fled, Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Note the questions. Why is it, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back? O mountains, that you skip like a ram? O hills like lambs? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turns the rock into a pool of water, and flint into a spring, into a spring. I'm sorry that I see that there's some static on the line, but I know nothing more to do than to carry on. My apologies for any ways that this is not coming through loud, loud and clear. It's important that in the community of faith that we support and love one another well, as Mark has said so beautifully. I share a bit of my own biography in relation to Palestine and to Israel. My first experience uh, in the region was as a college student spending the summer of 1972 on an archeological dig. This was in the run up to the 1972 Olympics, a very difficult time in the region. But the story of my first engagement was very one dimensional. I had learned in school about the creation of Israel in 1948. I had never heard any comment whatsoever on the Palestinian people, and I was, and because of this beginning, continued to be a typical American with much work to do. Fast forward 25 years. Our state of North Carolina had a short-lived partnership with the state of Israel, an economic education, scientific research, cultural partnership. Leah Ravine, uh, the widow of Prime Minister of Israel, spoke in Greensboro, North Carolina to a group of civic, religious, and business leaders. And as I listened eagerly to her comments, she said, we are tired of being David. We want to be Goliath. When I heard these words, I, I was stunned. I was stunned. I wanted to just say, stop, stop, stop. We are tired of being David. We want to be Goliath. Now, that statement stays with me over all of these years. And I confess that it was that statement that turned me toward doing more work across time and seeking to understand the region. Israel as Mark has so well said, uh, is not the same thing 
as Jewishness, uh, Zionism. Each of these words carry freight that we need to unpack with our people. And as a family of faith, it's important that we claim space in this present moment when there is so much on our plates to see the interweavings of power, of oppression, of guilt, of history, of memory, and to open up space for all of these conversations today. I was struck when I went again to the Kairos website to see the definition of the Greek word Kairos as favorable time or decisive epoch. That's what's on the Kairos website. This is also a Kairos time. Uh, this is a time for us to speak, for us to act, for us to seek, to be engaged. In Bethlehem, with a group of pilgrims from Mississippi, one of the group, who had done some reading ahead of time, asked, will someone please tell me what's going on here? Do you hear that bottom line question? Will someone please tell me what's going on here? A young mission intern with whom we were meeting described in three sentences the 1948 Nakba, the Palestinian removal, and the current situation of 22% Palestinian land. I want to pause for a minute because I'm seeing a lot of notes about not being heard. Jim? Uh, do I need to turn it back to Mark, who was heard? Because I don't want to frustrate everyone on the webinar. One thing you might be able to do is, and this is not ideal, but you could we could turn your video off um, because everyone else's video is off. So that could be the, and then you can continue to speak or we can turn I'll it I'll try it. Okay, I just stop the video and I'll talk to you. Is it better when I'm just talking? When I'm simply talking, can you hear better? Absolutely. Yeah, yes. All right, in that case, I'll simply talk and we'll pretend we're on radio. We'll be all audio. <laughs> the current racial reckoning in the United States uh, is, I believe, convergent with global experiences of systemic injustice and an ongoing need for reformation in our world. And so while while this seems like a time in which it would be most difficult, perhaps it is in God's Kairos time, a favorable time to re-engage. In Palestine, <clears throat> with 10 Pan Wesleyan women bishops, one morning we proposed waking early and going through the checkpoint on, checkpoint on foot with Palestinian people who do this every day. Our five AME, African Methodist Episcopal and Christian Methodist Episcopal sister bishops said, we don't need to do that. We've been there all our lives. There's an interweaving. Uh, there is a continued interweaving of the reality of power and of oppression uh, in all of our spaces out into the world. I was um, somewhat amazed at a religious news service article uh, published about a year ago in which uh, there was a survey, a poll of Jews in the United States. And 73% of Jews living in the United States said they felt less secure. 90% of them acknowledged being pro-Israel. But listen to this. In the list of the 16 priorities for Jewish voters in the United States, Israel was at the bottom of the list. Above that was health, gun safety, white supremacy, and on and on it went. Within, within the church, uh, we have an opportunity to be partners uh, with our Palestinian friends, Palestinian Christians, with Jews like our brother Mark uh, in order for us 
to witness for what is right and true, for us to have reality checks in regard uh, to what is out uh, in the media headlines and sound bites. And we are called uh, to engage with our people, uh, to teach, to make our people aware of the ways in which our church has moved uh, to undergird uh, ministry for justice and peace in Palestine. I'm gonna pause because I think it's not working. No, it, it does seem to be working, Bishop. Uh, well, the, it is working, <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, the, audio, the audio is much clearer now. Oh, okay, okay, great. I'd like to share with you a bit of experience of the task force on Israel-Palestine that was established by the 2016 General Conference. And as a result of the convening of the task force and a couple of years of work, um, we urge in our report to the 2020 General Conference of the United Methodist Church, uh, three things, that we would continue to focus on the oppression of people with particular view to the children in Gaza, Hebron, the West Bank, the children who live, who live under the apartheid uh, separation. That uh, we travel faithfully and prophetically because travel is a political act, as has been said, engaging with the present realities whenever any United Methodist or other groups travel to engage biblical history that we dialogue with missionaries now serving, that we invest in the economy of Palestine and our choices of hotels and restaurants and shops, and that we engage in holistic education relative to justice and peacemaking before, during, and after experiences in the region. I urge you uh, to check out the website, No Way to Treat a Child, Palestine Through the Eyes of Children and to uh, go online, it's easy to access the resolutions that have been passed. We also, in the run-up very soon to the season of Advent and Christmas, have an open opportunity, as we sing a little town of Bethlehem, to gently but powerfully describe uh, the reality and the place of the birth of Jesus, and to help people open themselves uh, again to the question question, is it, is it anti-Semitic to criticize the state of Israel? I believe as we teach, as we increase our experience in the region, as we help one another toward faithfulness, uh, we can find the strong no as an answer to that question. Jim, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you, Bishop. I appreciate your contribution. And I think we've we found a way to hear everything you have to say, uh, even though we lost sight of you. Uh, we have quite a number of questions. And uh, the first one I'll pose is, is to both of our presenters. Uh, should not the first task of modern Christians be to deeply study our own Christology and uh, to learn the history, the real history of Zionism in the late 19th century, uh, and then we can move on to other things. Please comment about that. Bishop, why don't you grab that one and I'll chime in. <clears throat> okay, I think that's absolutely right. Um, that as we engage the text, <clears throat> even as I read to you the Psalm for today, uh, we have opportunity continually as we teach, as we preach, as we have conversation out of scripture in Bible study groups, in cell groups, in youth groups, in groups of women and men, all kinds of groups, to have conversation uh, and deepen our understanding of the biblical story, of the story of Israel, of the story of Jesus, of the story of the early church story of the prophets, absolutely. And for us to understand, as Mark so well described, the uh, trauma which continues to live on in the, in the bodies transgenerationally um, of Jewish people around the world um, and to engage in compassionate ways to 
help us all live again deeply and faithfully into our faith traditions, which call us always toward justice and the beloved community and the human family. Um, uh, the, thank, thank you, Bishop. And, and I think that um, you're absolutely right that this is really a Kairos moment and we have to really, really take a close look at what our Bibles tell us, both Jews and, and Christians. Um, I think what I focus on in that question, Jim, is um, the first duty of Christians. Um, what I see happening, and again, this is very contextual in terms of the whole issue of, of the Kairos that is presented by Palestine, is that um, there was really, there was another Kairos, there was a wake up call to Christianity and to sort of white, white Western Christendom uh, after World War II, which was, you know, what have we done here? Uh, we have responsibility for this catastrophe, for this human rights catastrophe, for this genocide. And that has colored and characterized and guided and in some ways I think hijacked Christian theology since that time. Um, so that the Christian sin has become the sin against the Jews. And um, uh, it has made it um, incorrect and uh, almost sinful to even challenge the Jewish quest for self-determination, um, Bible has been brought in, etc. So I think that the real task now, uh, the real theological task, uh, the ecclesial ecclesiological task, um, is to take on, uh, as the World Council of Churches did back in the 60s, is to take on racism and today to take on neocolonialism and to take on neoliberalism and the systems that is impoverishing uh, so many people. Uh, of which Zionism and the state of Israel, as you could call it the fulcrum, you could call it the tip of the iceberg. Palestine presents an opportunity um, to crack open um, the way that our societies, which are still dominated by white patriarchy and our churches, which are still struggling with that. Uh, and I know, Bishop, you've done a lot of work um, in the whole issue of feminism and Christianity to crack open that. When you take a look at Palestine, it does that. It opens the door, that opens the door to that. So I think we Jews have to be able to get off of our, and recover from our preoccupation with our victimhood. Christians have to, you have to get over and deal with your preoccupation with your culpability um, and open up to the, the current context. Um, and uh, to put anti-Semitism where it belongs, along with a whole host of, of, of racist and uh, sort of white supremacist ideologies, and to, to, to take a look at what is really, what we are really dealing with, you will get pushback from your Jewish colleagues. How about us? How about us? How about us? And I think the correct response to that is, we love you, we have hurt you, we are really sorry, we're doing everything we can to correct that, we wanna maintain our relationships with you, but we have to turn to this and we invite you to join us. But I will again caution you, do not wait for Jews institutionally to walk with you. You again have to suffer the pain of um, leaving them behind if they choose to, to, to not walk with you on this, and, and to take on this issue. Well, thank you, Mark and Bishop. Uh, that kind of leads to another question, uh, probably for uh, Bishop Hope. Uh, what in your experience seems to work the best in getting Christians who are very sensitive to being called anti-Semitic uh, to overcome our fear of criticizing Israel? Bishop, are you there? <laughs> Have we lost her? Hey, sorry, the mute was still on. My apologies. <laughs> there she is. Circling the chairs and having the conversation, conversation by conversation by conversation. Um, as as we uh, 
share our understandings and become lifelong learners and listen to one another, uh, the possibilities are pretty amazing. I commend to you all a, a recent novel, A Paragon by Colin McCann. It's actually the story of a Palestinian and an Israeli, uh, two fathers who lost their daughters to violence. And it's beautifully written. But one place in the comment is made, what it means to remember is different than never forgetting. Never forget, never forget has a sort of belligerence about it, a, a militarization about it, a forcefulness about it that is certainly appropriate at times, but what it means to remember. And in this time when many of us on this webinar are, are living here in the United States, we're having that difficulty in our own context. And it's important uh, that, that we help one another remember in a way that is gentle, um, that is powerful, that's transformative. I put the book in the chat just now, A Paragon by Colin McCann. Great, thank you. Uh, we've had a number of questions related to uh, the Bible and uh, Old Testament references to uh, promises of the land. And uh, some people also commenting that uh, other parts of, of the Hebrew scripture uh, talk about the promise to the land, but also include uh, being able to keep the land by behaving with righteousness and justice. Uh, Mark, would you comment on that, please? Okay, yeah. All right. This is the, um, this is what's been uh, called the Deuteronomic con condition. Uh, Brueggemann writes about this a lot. He talks about the land as very, very important. And it is, it's a very, very powerful reality as well as metaphor in the Old Testament. Um, and um, it's promised, but it also can be taken away. And um, Deuteronomy in particular, and in the prophets as well, but certainly in Deuteronomy, so if you'll be kicked out, you will lose it um, if you do not obey my commandments and you're not faithful to the Torah. That, that's well and good. And this is often used as a justification by people who are apologists for Israel, saying, yes, 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 we will take the land, but we will, you know, we'll, we'll be good to our, <laughs> we'll be good to our Palestinians, um, and we will be just. So it feels to me like that is used, that argument is used to justify and to apologize for Zionism and for the, all the evils that have, that have come from it. Um, I mean, I would just like to say, I'm an anti-Zionist, it's very clear. It doesn't mean that I think all the Jews should pick up and leave Israel. The Jews of Israel are home. They have built what they thought was going to be a wonderful society. It's been an amazing achievement. They need to, they're home and they need to be protected so that they can stay at home. But they also need to have a decent society to bring up their children in. And they don't have that now. And so we have to work to liberate them from the evil of apartheid, as, as well as the Palestinians, just like the world took a stand and liberated both white and black from the evil of apartheid in South Africa. So I just want to say that. Um, but to get back to the Bible, um, I believe that the, um, the whole issue of you have to, you can have the land, you can ethnically cleanse the pop, you know, the indigenous, and you can have the land, but you will lose it if you, um, if, if you sin. But don't forget, and this goes all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through to the last book, to the last line in Chronicles, where the Jews are returning from the Babylonian Empire, from exile, that the promise is never taken off the table. There is always restoration. You always get the land back. So that, yes, the prophets especially are all about social justice, and that is a huge, important, central, core thing going on in the Old Testament. But even the prophets never depart from the tribal context of this is our land, we get to stay in it. Uh, with the return in exile, we are prohibited from intermarrying. We have to maintain the purity of, of, of the race. 
of the family. Um, and God, yes, can take it away again, but we'll always get it back because God loves us and God will forgive us and we'll be given another chance. That's the Old Testament. I call that Kingdom of God 1.0 is the original promise. Kingdom of God 1.5 is the prophetic challenge to um, uh, how the, the, the land has been defiled by the sins. Then there's Kingdom of God 2.0, and that's Jesus who says, okay, it's over. Yes, it's all about justice, but now we have to depart from the tribal paradigm and say that if there is one God, then this has to be for everybody and we can no longer build a temple and a house for God on a hill on a particular mountain. Jesus said that. We're no longer going to worship on one mountain, woman at the well, but in the spirit, that means all the territoriality is gone. We have left the Old Testament context with respect to land. Thank you. Uh, By the way, the Palestinians say that in, their, in, in the 2009 Kairos Palestine document. They talk about a theology of land. So right. theology of land is a major, major task for us theologically now to remove this barrier to the church acting because the church has to act. The church has taken the lead. It took the lead in South Africa. It took the lead in the United States with the fights against racism. It took the lead uh, in, in, in the World Council of Churches in the 60s with the program to combat racism. The church has an important role to play politically here because frankly, if you take a look at what's happening politically with the, with the powers, it's not going to happen that way. And in that way, I commend two books to you. One is, they're brand new. What is by Rashid Khalidi? I'll, I'll type them into the, into the chat, uh, called The Hundred Years' War on Palestine. And the other is by Nura Arakat, called Justice for Some. And it really gives you a sense about how the Palestinians have been completely passed over in the entire diplomatic and political uh, arena for the last hundred years. I think only the church can, can fix that. I mean, I'm sorry, that's my charge to you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Bishop Ward, we have an interesting uh, take. Uh, I'm not sure everybody on the webinar is familiar with the, uh, the small postcards that are available uh, that have a picture of the little town of Bethlehem on one side Joseph and Mary and a little donkey on the other side, mm -hmm. and today's barrier wall in between, and yes. it says the little town of Bethlehem. People are asking how they might be able to use these during uh, Advent and Christmas without being uh, perhaps so in your face or, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, as Mark has so wisely said, um, it's always a dangerous opportunity to move into these conversations. But I just want to comment on the land piece that we were just, that Mark was just commenting on in, in answering. Here in the United States, as we reckon with our history, it's all about land. It's all about settling. It's all about taking. Um, and so, again, as we begin to open up conversations in many places, the segue, the segue to other places in the world where there have been settler nations, where land has been taken. Um, it's an opportune time. I have used uh, those postcards um, among people of common mind as a greeting. I have used those postcards and pictures um, among people who are lifelong learners, who are willing, willing to lean in. I have not sent them to people who I think uh, would be incensed by the receipt of such a card. So I think pastoral wisdom guides, uh, but I certainly think it would be a, a wonderful opportunity as we take out our nativity scenes that have the Magi on one side of the fence, unable to cross over to the manger um, and, and have them in our homes and offices and places where people can see. It's a witness to our commitment. And I think also just sharing the art that is on the separation wall. The pictures of the, the art on the wall um, is a wonderful teaching moment. A time to open up questions. What do you see? What do you see? What does it mean to you? So again, it's a questioning 
the powerful question is held above us. All right, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions about theology again, as you might expect, um, specifically replacement theology. Uh, given that that uh, is described as a flawed approach, uh, what theology might be uh, better employed to, uh, to be talking with people about and, and how to avoid anti-Semitism uh, while lifting up our Christian heritage and not denigrating a Jewish heritage? We have a continual challenge around literalism uh, and the, the place where, where some of our people find themselves um, in terms of literal understandings of certain scriptures. <laughs> because it's impossible to be a literalist, really, and read the Bible from beginning to end, uh, because we are a selective literalist. But helping people learn ways of interpretation that are faithful to the in intent of the text, uh, the rhythms of God, the purposes of God, the varying sorts of literature that make up the scripture. You know, all of that has to be a part of teaching uh, the scripture to people so that the heartbeat of God's word to humanity comes through to us. Um, yeah, thank, thank you, Bishop. I agree with you completely. Uh, and the question is again, what, what, what is that heartbeat? Um, I think one, I mean, I would go back to what I said before about replacement theology. I don't think that it is, uh, if, if if we go back to the Gospels, it's not in there. Um, uh, yes, you can find verses that can be interpreted that way. Uh, but again, I think we need to embrace when Jesus talks about bringing something new. This is what radical reform is all about. And uh, I think the Jews got stuck in their, um, in their territoriality and their sense of tribalism. I mean, why not? It's nice to be chosen. Uh, it's nice to be special. And I think that that's one reason why, um, I think in a paradoxical way, um, uh, taking uh, steps against replacement theology, or in fact, um, re uh, it's a way to re-embrace or to reclaim the original tribal promise. Uh, one problem with the whole thing of the whole issue of replacement theology or not replacement theology, supersessionism, anti-supersessionism is that it's kind of a Judeo-Christian conversation. And Mitri Rahab, the Palestinian pastor and theologian, says we need to confront the fact that the whole idea of the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition is kind of a myth. I mean, what is that really? And I will tell you what I think it is really. It's a way of saying we Judeo-Christians um, think that we really, um, it's, that is a kind of exclusivism and exceptionalism. I mean, it kind of leaves out everybody else. There are these folks called Muslims. There are these folks called Buddhists and Hindus and, uh, and, and, and a, a host of people who subscribe to other beliefs, many of them monotheistic. What is this business of Judeo-Christianity? And why is it so important to work out whether or not Christianity has replaced Judaism. Let's open it up to what the Bible really says, um, which is that we only have one God, um, that his house is the entire uh, world, and that we all live in that house, and that that, speaking theologically, is what God wants. Jim, you're muted. Yeah. I want to note for people that uh, we have come up to about an hour of time with our two presenters, and uh, we honor that uh, commitment to you all. So if people have to leave now, we do understand that. Uh, you will receive an email telling you uh, when the webinar is posted and how to access that uh, recording. So we will continue. Uh, there are more questions coming up. And uh, we, we thank you for being with us who, who have to leave now. 
but we also thank the people who can stay with us for a couple of more minutes as we deal with a couple of more of the key questions. Uh, Mark started to deal with this a little bit just now. Um, people are asking, well, what about the Muslims? How do they figure into all of this? Uh, virtually all of the media that we see in the U.S. characterizes them as bad guys, more specifically terrorists. Uh, and yet here we are uh, in the midst of supporting Palestinians uh, who are majority Muslim, uh, though there are a number of very active Christians and others in the Palestinian community. So how do we uh, approach this whole idea of, of Muslims being characterized as bad and anti-Israel? Again, the interpersonal dynamic of knowing people, speaking with them, working with them is absolutely essential. Here in Eastern North Carolina, in our ongoing hurricane response, having disastrous hurricanes one after the other, uh, we have a wonderful partnership um, with Islamic Relief. And we have found that to be a gift to our connection to our communities, to our homeowners, uh, the way that we have been mutually enriched in this partnership and mission is remarkable. And I'll lift that up as one example of ways to work together in such a way that the world looking on sees community, compassion, peace, justice, lived out hand in hand. Thanks, Bishop. The only thing I would add to that is um, to go back to, to my point, go back to my point about um, uh, Jews and Christians and this being, uh, become, becoming a Jewish Christian um, conversation. Um, I think that uh, as far as Christians are concerned, um, the more you can um, step back from the preoccupation with Jewish sensitivity and uh, Jewish concerns, and let us have our family argument about this while reassuring us that you love us and you're still with us, uh, and in loving us, you, are help, you want to help us uh, stop doing what we're doing in Israel. Uh, the more you can do that, the more you can open up to the wider world um, and confront what I think is a huge question, which is how much the, the clash of civilizations and Islamophobia, how strongly that plays here. Again, I can't stress this more strongly. Um, defense uh, is defense of colonialism and of, uh, and of white supremacy. And uh, in, a, in a perfect storm, Islamophobia and the fear of those dark people who worship another god and who hate our freedom, the Arabs, um, plays into that very, very well. And so um, I think that we need, to, we need to speak up for that and we need to make sure that there's plenty of room and plenty of voice, as, Bishop, as the Bishop said, to have those conversations and to open up to the, to the Muslim world. Right. Another question, uh, this has to do with uh, the liturgy that we in Christian churches hear week in and week out, uh, in, usually in praise of Israel, Israelite people, and so on. Uh, can you help us contrast uh, that perspective with uh, the modern state of Israel? Uh, I hear those, those songs of praise, and my guess is that very, very few people singing those songs are thinking about the state of Israel. They are thinking um, in United Methodist churches, perhaps in other groups of Christians and Mary uh, in Zionist, Christian Zionist, possibly. But among those who I see who have collected on this call, I think, um, I think that we don't think enough 
about Israel and enough about Palestine. It's not on the radar of most of our people. When I have sought to convene conversations about um, such as the one we are now in, you know, I struggled to find 20 people together because it's not on the radar of our people. It is on the radar of you wonderful people, 200 strong. But how do we expand the people uh, who are concerned about this, who are alert to this, who want to engage? That for me is the critical question. I would just say that the, um, when Ben Gurion uh, and his folks decided to call uh, the new Jewish state the State of Israel, they knew what they were doing. Um, they were um, intentionally wanting um, to capitalize on the whole biblical tradition and the whole liturgical um, tradition. So um, I hear what you're saying, Bishop. I would submit that maybe uh, for people who are aware of it and are thinking about it, uh, they can make that distinction. But otherwise, I think that even unconsciously on a subliminal level, um, it goes in and it works that when we pray for Israel and when we uh, sacralize Israel, whatever that means liturgically, um, we are um, supporting um, the whole concept that the state of Israel is the fulfillment of biblical promises. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, of course, is very, very dangerous and very, very destructive. Okay, Mark, we have a, a question that was directed to you, um, asking us to consider for a bit the, uh, not brand new, but maybe new to some people, uh, IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism, uh, how and why it's being used to censor social media, and also to generate Christ, uh, criticism of any organizations that happen to be working for Palestinian rights. Great, thanks, Jim. And actually, I was um, alerted to this one. I want to just share, share the screen on this. Um, oh, you know what, uh, Bridget, you need, to, you need to enable my screen sharing again. Uh, it's still disabled. But let me just say while I'm waiting for that to happen, I yeah. wanted to mention before when we were talking about those theological questions, especially the whole issue of replacement theology, if Gary, Dr. Gary Burge is still um, with us, I, I wish it were uh, allowable to give him the floor on this because uh, he's written the book on it. And I would just recommend to you Gary Burge, B-U-R-G-E, um, Jesus and the Land. Um, if you want a, the, the word on how we can better understand the New Testament in, in terms of the Old Testament promises about the land. Okay, let's see if I can share this here. Yeah, great, okay. Uh, okay, the International Holocaust Remembrance Association, I think it, I may have the date wrong, it may be 2014. Um, this is playing very, very big in Europe. Um, and um, especially in the UK. Uh, if you read Stephen Sizer's article and you've got the link to it, he does a great job covering it. This is, look, this, this whole thing is a direct response to BDS. Israel is behind it. Um, and, and a whole network of theologians and activists who are working to try to, um, to preserve Zionism and to apologize for it and to, and to, keep, it, uh, to keep it kosher and acceptable. Now, it's based on a couple of things. These are, it's a longer document. I just drew a few bullet points. Here's what's going on here. Um, it, first of all, it's a setup to legally and legislatively get laws in, and we see this happening certainly in the United States and in Britain, um, to make BDS basically illegal or difficult for individuals and for companies, okay? Uh, and to smear it as, as anti-Semitic. <clears throat> now, so that, that's the first thing we need to understand. You need to also understand that it absolutely is, the assumption is that Zionism and Judaism and the state of Israel and the Jewish people are completely conflated. There's no differentiation, okay? Um, so that's, you know, all of these things can be used anti-Semitically 
Okay, the last one in particular, holding Jews collectively responsible for the actions of the state of Israel. I mean, in Germany, where they're having this huge problem with, with neo-Nazism, or just, just call it Nazism and, and reactionary right-wing stuff going on, there's a lot of anti-Semitism going on, and um, they, were, they are using the crimes of the state of Israel to justify that. So I'm not saying that people are not um, using um, this issue uh, to promote their own anti-Semitic agenda. My answer to that would be great, take away their ammunition, fix Israel, stop it from happening so that they don't have that excuse because what they're saying is true. The Jewish state founded by Jews for Jews is committing human rights crimes. Now, you cannot hold Jews collectively responsible, but the Jewish state, you know, has said, Israel has said, we're the Jewish state, we're doing this for the Jews. So can you, can you blame people? How do you defend against that, that, that when in fact, the whole thing is set up in such a way that Jews and the state of Israel are completely conflated and identified um, with one another? So there have been legal defenses. The good news about this is, and again, Sizer's article covers this really well, it's illegal. It's illegal in the United States to say you can't boycott. And the ACLU is on it, and there are people in Congress that are on it. And so there's a fight going on. That's a good thing because again, it raises consciousness about well, what is this about Israel and why is BDS wrong? And what is BDS? So it's, it's, it's a good conversation to be, to be going on. But that's what this I IHRA thing is all about. Okay. And uh, I think it's been said a couple of times, but um, BDS is boycott, uh, divestment, and sanction. And it's, so it's a three-pronged approach to uh, trying to get uh, the attention of companies profiting from doing business uh, in Israel, uh, especially uh, those that impact the Palestinian uh, territory and Palestinian people. Uh, on that note, uh, Bishop Hope, uh, how might people deal with our politicians and elected representatives who uh, seem to be showing such zeal for supporting the anti-BDS legislation that's going around the country? Again, I think we have to build coalitions locally and uh, petition advocate for justice, and we can do that from a stronger position if we do this <clears throat> with our Jewish friends who are of common mind, our Muslim friends who are of common mind. If we come from a broader perspective, perhaps than only the Christian communions, um, as we build coalitions locally to engage uh, and to press our officials, um, there's power. See, we've got, uh, there are a couple of more questions that seem to be right on that same theme. So I'll look down to, uh, uh, how about uh, dealing briefly with uh, the efforts on college campuses to suppress or censor free speech uh, and actually trying to get different organizations kicked off of our college and university campuses for appearing to be anti-Israel. I mean, this is, uh, again, um, Israel is behind it. Um, there, there are uh, organizations that uh, don't identify as such, but are covers for um, uh, um, projects that are being funded and guided directly from, um, uh, from Israel. Uh, Israel really got mobilized about this in 2010, again, as a result of BDS. Um, and they are um, framing uh, their work as free speech on campus, defending um, Jewish students in particular from being um, smeared and discriminated against um, for their support of the uh, of Palestinian liberation. It's happening on a lot of campuses. I'm not quite sure what we do about that. Uh, I think the, the, 
the, the campus groups internally on each campus are doing a pretty good job of, of managing that. There was a big, big flare up uh, in the University of California some, some years ago. But again, it's another battleground. And again, I think, uh, you know, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think uh, as, as long as the discourse um, is happening, it raises consciousness about the fact that this is a human rights issue. And um, ultimately, I mean, my, my hope, my belief, my prayer is that it will not work and the arc of history will bend toward justice. Amen. Well, I think uh, there are a few more questions, but I think we've uh, pretty much run the gamut uh, talking about the, uh, the issue now. Hope that we've been able to provide some resources. There are quite a number of suggested resources that have appeared in the chat lately. And uh, it is possible for participants to save the chat. Uh, there's a little uh, icon down at the bottom where you can expand that and save it to your computer so that you can uh, reference the different uh, people and, and books and videos and things like that that have been recommended, not only by our presenters, but by some very learned people who have participated uh, in this webinar. I want to thank uh, Bishop Hope Ward and Mark Braverman for uh, a wonderful and stimulating time. We have uh, all learned something from you all and have something to go to work on uh, as we proceed forward with our UMKR and MFSA programs. We invite you to stay tuned to us as we continue our webinar series. Uh, we'll be out with information about October and subsequent months shortly. And we are working on things like uh, legislation that is being presented in the US Congress uh, we're in touch with some of our legislators who might be available to help us out on that and some other exciting things. So as we leave you today, we wish you grace and peace in the name of Jesus Christ and wish you uh, a safe and prosperous holiday season coming up over the next couple of months that involves all of us, uh, Jews and Christians alike. So thank you for joining us and good day.